This is Casey James. I don't know where exactly I am. I don't know what's going on. There's a lot I don't know. But I'm going to figure it out. I wasn't dreaming, though. Seriously, I was awake. And a giant snake tried to bite me. Okay, but... You also drowned and woke up in bed. That's Deacon. He's... I guess you could say he's a friend of mine, although I've only known him for four days. He's known me for over a month, apparently. We've been neighbours for that long. Our rooms at the hotel are side by side, and we share a bathroom. He's nice, although I think he thinks I'm mental. That doesn't mean it didn't happen, I say. After all, if disjointed, dreamlike events mean that something didn't really happen, or isn't really happening, then I could safely write off this entire bloody town as not really happening. Kingsport is the oddest place I've spent any length of time. We're walking on the beach as we talk. Me, Deacon and the couple we met yesterday at the hotel bar, Leanne and David. Well, I say we met at the bar, but it was one of those I saw you across the tennis court and I liked your vibe situations, really. I was loitering, looking at my phone, watching a magpie across the road intimidate some kid, watching the pretty girl in the red shorts playing tennis. She leaned over again to pick up the ball, and I wondered if it was intentional. I mean, she played tennis really abominably badly. I'm not one to judge here, I can barely hit the ball, but I don't get up on a tennis court and show off the fact. Maybe it was the first time she'd played. Her partner was being a remarkably good sport about it. I wondered if there were a couple. I didn't ask. It would be weird to discover that I already knew them, and I had enough faux pas of that sort in the last couple of days that I've taken to just smiling and nodding and not introducing myself to people, just in case. Deacon, on the other hand, just wandered up to them and said hello, offered to buy a round of drinks. Turns out we didn't know one another. They only arrived at the hotel that morning. Deacon bought us all drinks and carried the conversation while... I was awkward and weird, and we all ended up drinking Bloody Maria's and talking about tequila. It was the most relaxing conversation I've had in days. Maybe weeks. Just normal, you know? It was nice. Leanne said that they were there together, but just friends. And she flirted indiscriminately with me and Deacon both, and with David. He just agreed grinned and bought me a drink in the next round. So, we were all nursing at least mild hangovers this morning, but none of the rest of them had suffered insomniac strolls with ghosts that turned into snakes and tried to eat them, or climb inside them, although I didn't mention that part. It seemed sort of private, and I definitely wasn't going to tell my new friends that I had a, well, whatever walker is possessing me. I did get a sort of internal hum at that, a feeling of approval and amusement, which was not weird at all, at all. Yeah, I tried not to think too hard about it. In any case, my plan was to look for the cave I'd gone into last night, and see if it was even actually there by daylight. If the tunnel led anywhere at all much less to some forgotten Roman bathhouse entombed in the rocks of the Kingsport Cliffs. I think Deacon, David and Leanne came along out of misplaced, or possibly accurately placed, concern, in spite of their hangovers. You know, you're probably just dreaming, says Leanne. If I was dreaming, I say, then I was also sleepwalking. Or something. Because yes, I woke up in bed. Fully dressed, covered in sand, wet, 
and with my shoes on and soaked in seawater. That is strange, says David. I feel like I should recognise his voice, but I can't think from where. It's a pleasant voice, but ordinary enough. Just another tourist. Maybe he reminds me of someone. There were always stories about funny things happening around Kingsport, says Deacon. I pause and glance at him. Were... are there? What sorts of things? Oh, you know, the usual. Uh, dark cults, weird rituals conducted around the old monolith. There are even a few alien abduction stories floating about, says Deacon. The old monolith, I say, eyebrows raised. He shrugs, and David chuckles at something, and <laughs> we all carry on walking along the beach. The tide is out, exposing an expanse of pebbles and sand, strewn with shells and seaweed. And on our other side is the line of trees that separates the beach itself from the road. After a moment, Leanne says, The story is, is that if anyone sleeps in the vicinity of the Black Stone on Midsummer's Eve, that person will be haunted by horrific nightmares forever after. But... If you can stay awake the whole night, sunset to sunrise, then you've been blessed by the old ones. Okay, I say, slowly. Deacon gives her a strange look and says, That's awfully specific. Ah, I wrote a paper on von Junst and his key of the cults, says Leanne carelessly. It was interesting. You could say it's the reason we're here, says David. We're planning to go up to the stone tonight and see if it's true. Tonight, I begin, but before I can get another word out, Leanne says, Midsummer, yes. There is no cave in the cliffs when we get there. Just a shallow tide pool currently cut off entirely from the bay by that expanse of sand, although I suppose at high tide it probably reconnects. Called it, says Leanne. I sigh, but I don't have any real response. <sighs> I was so sure that it was real. But if there's no cave there now, how did my clothes and shoes get wet? Where was I last night? What now? Asks Deacon. Why don't we go up to the stone, since we're halfway there already? Says David. We haven't seen it by daylight yet. The way he says that makes me curious. Wary, even. Why would he specify that they haven't seen it by daylight? Surely they can't have been up there at night if they only arrived in Kingsport yesterday. I must zone out for a minute while I'm thinking about it, because when I tune back into the conversation, it's all decided just like that. We're going up the mountain to look at the monolith on the cliffs. I have to admit, I was interested to see it, even if the whole exercise seemed like a really bad idea. When have I been known for making good decisions? My first clue that something is perhaps more wrong than expected is the trees. To begin with, there are too many of them. More than there should be, but they're also not the right types. I mean, I wouldn't be able to tell you what sort of trees do grow around Kingsport, but these aren't them. They're... They're gnarled and wrinkled like old leather, with prickly grey-green leaves and the odd occasional white flower, and they smell of honey and pine resin and turpentine. I keep climbing anyway, following David and Deacon and Leanne up this narrow, winding pathway that looks like it was made for and by goats rather than people. The summit of the cliffs is even more thickly wooded, but the path continues on here, 
tiny dirt track between prickly underbrush and gnarled tree trunks. It has that closed-in, secretive feeling of a children's tree fort, like nothing exists in the world except for the four of us in this path. The light is dusty and faded, almost sepia-toned, as it filters through the trees, and the sky is a strange, washed-out colour, streaked with clouds. It's not far from the top of the cliff to the clearing where the monolith stands. It should be further. I feel like we don't walk nearly long enough to get to the edge of the cliffs. The path just ends, abrupt, unexpected, in a clear space that looks out over the bay. The monolith stands in the centre of that clear circle, an octagonal piece of black stone, maybe twelve or fourteen foot tall, more than twice my height at any rate. Its surface is scuffed, weathered, although it looks as though it was once polished smooth, and there are odd characters and glyphs spiralling their way up the sides and around the shaft to the top. Even in the late afternoon sunlight, Wait, when did it get so late? Wasn't it just morning? Something isn't right here. I look around warily, but the others don't seem to have noticed anything. They're all staring at the monolith, with expressions of frankly disturbing awe and reverence in the cases of Leanne and David, and slight unease in the case of Deacon. It's not that I don't understand the feelings, of awe and unease both, although reverence would be pushing it. The monolith squats there like some sleeping animal, and the shape of it somehow carries a suggestion of dark antiquity, a hint of unnatural events that I can sense through some instinct, in the same way that one senses rather than really hears the flowing of a dark, subterranean river in the night. It used to be the focal point for a coven of witches, says Leanne. Her comment startles me out of whatever reverie I've fallen into, and I blink back into focus. I swear I recognise her voice from somewhere. Somewhere else, I mean. I can't place it, though. Witches, really, says Deacon. I stare at the monolith at the weird characters spiralling up its sides like nothing I've ever seen before. Not that I'm that familiar with hieroglyphics in general, but still. Witches, yes, says Leanne. And then she starts reading the sigils on the stone out loud. Ia, Ia, Goth Unft Fai, Isli Ha, Armas. Aretz tika fa, ore unft, ion istel bsna ahai, nogsli aha ah ngli, ia. I don't know what language she's speaking, and I don't know how I know that she's reading the sigils rather than just chanting some nonsense words, but I do know it. I even recognize the words in that foggy, deja vu way that you recognise things you've seen or heard in dreams. Ia, Ia, Goth Unft Fai, Isli Ha, Armas, Aretz Tik Afa, Are Unft, Ion, Istel Bsna, Ahai, Nogsli Aha Ah, Ngli, Ia, then David smiles at me, just lightly, and joins in, his voice blending with hers. Ya, ya, gofn gift, fai, isli ha, amros, aretz tika fa, ore unft, iun, istel bisna, ahai, nogsli ha, I know suddenly where I've heard those words before. 
As the light fades and the sun slides down the horizon in fast forward motion, I remember the voices, layered, chanting in the kitchen of the bridge house as I tried to wake up. As a silver mist slipped into the room, drifting in what might or might not have been a dream, into the shape of a man. And I know where I've seen David's face before, too, because it was the same memory. That beautiful, horrible face, with lips like tar and blood. I feel sick. In the twilight, there is a man standing between us and the monolith. It no longer looks like a squat and crumbling remnant of some prehistoric tribal religion, but like the spire of some colossal buried black castle. Like the finger bones of a giant, reaching up out of the earth. In front of that black stone, silhouetted against the setting sun, stands a man with antlers on his brow like a king's stag. For a moment, he seems like a giant, impossibly tall and broad, before I blink and he's... Well, he's still tall and broad, and as frighteningly wild as a lion or a feral dog, or a storm, maybe. Something not even animal in its motivations and desires. Leanne and David are swaying and spinning in place in front of this horned man, still chanting. It's dizzying to watch them, but looking away from them isn't any better. Behind the stone and the horned man, the red blaze of the setting sun across the bay looks like fire, and shadows curl around the clearing like smoke. Deacon seems frozen in place, which is understandable, I guess. It just turned from mid-morning to sunset in the space of about five minutes, and our new friends turn out to be, at best, weird cultists. The rhythm of Leanne and David's swaying bodies grows faster, until I can almost hear the drum beats that they're dancing to. Leanne's long hair flying loose around her face. The horned man steps forward towards her, and the light catches on his face. I don't want to see it. I don't want to know who or what is here pretending to be the god of the woods. Pretending because there is nothing holy about this. It's obscene, strange and awful and terrifying in a way that goes well beyond the fact of cultists and rituals on top of the cliffs. So before I can see the horned man's face, I turn and run. I grab Deacon's hand as I go and try to drag him along with me, although it makes both of us stumble as we go. The prickly leaves of the trees tear and scratch at us, but I really don't care. Scratches and grazes, even the risk of a turned ankle running through the woods like this, is not in my list of top ten things to worry about right now. Behind us, the chanting continues, along with that suggestion of drums, played by invisible hands. And now there's a high, wild piping that makes shivers crawl down my spine. Ariel! I call. I hope she can hear me. I hope I didn't just dream her or hallucinate her or something. Ariel, I need help! The shadows of that thorny woodland stretch and gather, masking the treacherous slope of the cliffs in darkness, edged in bright red gold, where the last of the sunlight gleams and glitters, making the shadows seem darker than ever. No wind moves through the trees, but there is an intangible rustling and whispering that makes me think of blasphemous rituals. Witches and beasts cavorting and prostrating themselves to the mysterious, horrifying presence that is the horned man and the monolith. They merge in my panicked mind the stone and that tall, horned figure, both looming behind me in the sound of drums and chanting and strange, eerie flutes. I feel as if I am trapped in a nightmare. There is a sort of breathless tension in the shadows and the trees, as if some unseen monster is holding its breath, waiting, 
but at least the sound of drums and chanting fades, finally, panting. I burst through into an open space, still dragging Deacon with me, and it's, it's a graveyard. It's an old, overgrown graveyard, a clearing full of mossy tombstones and plots of turf that have been half reclaimed by the woods. And Ariel is there. Ariel. Translucent and ghost-like, with her strange, terrifying, alien face that isn't a face, and her pale, storm-cloud eyes, and I have never been so grateful to see anyone. Until she says, You've stirred up a weasel's nest now, Casey. I shouldn't be here. 